Well, this morning, we're going to be starting our new series called What's It Going to Look Like? Now, I'm going to warn you right now, you're going to get tired of hearing this question. But for the next four weeks, you're going to hear it over and over again. What's it going to look like? We will repeat that question about five crucial areas of our spiritual lives as Christ followers. Trust, community, prayer, serving, and generosity. So this morning we are going to focus on the question, what's it going to look like for me to trust God in the year 2020? So if you're visiting with us this morning, I'm glad that you're here. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, a challenge that we set out to our church is also a challenge I give to you as we talk about what is 2020 going to look like to trust, to trust God. Now, think of what a, a complete lack of trust would look like if you lived in a world where there was, in everyday life, zero trust. So after you leave church this afternoon, you're going to head to Chartier to have a nice lunch. But you like your steak done just right, so you're going to make sure you go in the back of the kitchen and you're going to cook it just the way you like it because they might not get it quite right. And the seasoning, you only like it a particular way, so you're going to take care of that. Following that, you might go, to the, you might go and you've got an a end-of-the-year deposit that you need to take care of with your money, but you're not going to go to a bank because we don't trust the bank. In fact, we're not even just going to get a big bag of cash because we don't really know if we can trust the value of currency. Gold is the only thing that I feel is really trustworthy. So you just add a small nugget of gold to your gold pile underneath your mattress. Which, by the way, if you have one of those, I would like to hear more about that story. Then, uh, tomorrow, when you go to take your child to school, instead of leaving to go home or go to work, you take the seat next to them because you're not really sure if you can trust that teacher and what, do they really know how to teach the kid math? I don't I don't really know. I'm just going to stay here just to make sure that they're doing it right and that my kid's paying attention. Forget about ever going on an airplane. I wouldn't do that. But then again, I kind of need to because I've got a, a work thing that I've got to do on the other side of the country. So I'm just going to make sure that I go to the front. And I'm not going to take the steering wheel out of the hands of the pilot, but I'm going to sit beside him because I want to make sure that he knows what he's doing and he's going the right direction could go on and on, but can you imagine what every day would look like without trust? Some may come to define you as controlling or paranoid, but one thing you would definitely be, and that would be exhausted. Because life is exhausting when you are always needing to be in control. When you are never in a position where you can trust someone else. According to researchers, psychologists, and sociologists, we are a culture that struggles greatly with trust. I want to read a few quotes from an article entitled The Decline of Trust, written for Psychological Today. It says this, We live in a world of social competition, and in a world in which trust is eroding. Trust in government has declined from 73% in 1958 to 24% in 2014, according to the Pew Research Center. And only 40% of people trust the media as a, good deal, as a good deal or fair amount, according to a 2015 Gallup poll. This is an all-time low. Trust in each other has been in steady decline since the 1970s, 48.1% in 1972 trusted other people, trusted each other, to 31.9% in 2014. With each succeeding generation, we are becoming less and less trustful. Again, according uh, to Pew Research, while boomers are the most trusting generation, trusting others at, at 40%, millennials trust others the least at 19%. Distrust is linked with anxiety, loneliness, depression, jealousy, and many more negative byproducts. So this morning, quickly to, together this morning, I want us to go through three questions. And if you ask quickly, it's because Jeff didn't speak for a minute and a half. That's why. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. You guys did a really great job. 
But three questions I hope we can help answer in our brief time remaining together this morning. What is trust? Why is this area of trust so often a struggle in our lives? And how can I trust God? And hopefully this will help us define what's it going to look like for you and for me to grow in trusting God in 2020. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to open to the book of Proverbs. If you split your Bible in half, if you're right in the middle, you're going to get somewhere between Psalms and Proverbs. But the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. And this is going to be the text we work out of this morning. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And this is what it says. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. If church has been part of your life and part of your history and a regular practice for you, you've probably heard these verses before. Some of you maybe even as a kid learned to memorize these verses. But I want to break it down really simply this morning. So the first thing I want to look at is what is trust? This word trust in the Lord. Trust is the word batak, which means to have confidence in, to be bold Listen to these words also, to be secure and to feel safe. Trust, according to Webster's Dictionary, is assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. I want to ask you this morning, what would it look like to be bold, to be secure, and to feel safe? In God. How would you live your life differently if you had full reliance in God, in His character, in His ability, His strength, and His integrity? How would you approach the unknown challenges of life if you had this knowledge and this type of reliance on God? If you knew He was good if you knew he was trustworthy, and if you absolutely, without question, knew that he was able. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. This word heart means your inner man, your will, your understanding, your conscience, your emotions, and your thinking. It is not merely an intellectual knowledge. That's the key but trust within the very core of our being. Trust with all your heart. What would it look like for you if you absolutely trusted God? If you felt secure and safe in God? Now I'm going to tell you about one of, I've spoken about how I love Christmas and I love a lot of the traditions that surround Christmas, but I'm going to tell you one of the things I really dislike around Christmas time. I love looking at lights on houses. I really detest hanging lights on houses. Now, I don't know how you feel, but I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of what it's like to hang lights with a deer doll. It's going to involve a lot of murmuring, negative self-talk, sweating, fear of death, and eventually at some point, really crooked lights hanging across the top. That's what it's like. It's how it was for my father, and I now boldly share that tradition on with my son as he has to watch dad slowly, painfully climb a ladder and awkwardly try and clip lights only really six, seven, eight feet off the ground, but looking like he might as well be 30,000 feet above the ground. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing with a ladder. The reality is is that if you're actually going to use this thing, there has to be a level of trust with it. If I fall over, you will never forget this sermon, by the way. Okay? We're going to start right here, but there has to be a level of trust. When I'm climbing and I'm hanging Christmas lights and literally putting my life at risk, it's that severe. 
There's a level of trust in the latter that it is going to hold. There is a belief that there is security there that it will hold me. Because I am not climbing up if I don't believe that. But why for us do we struggle with trust? It's the second question I want us to quickly look at. Because we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on your own understandings. Lean or trust or find support in. Don't do, lean or trust or find support in your own understanding, in your own simple knowledge, in your own self-discernment. The reality is, is if we want to get up to where God is calling us to, if we say we see the work and the power of the cross that forgives all sin and brings new life and calls us beyond ourselves and calls us to do things we are incapable of, we can pretend for a moment like we are leaning on God, that we are trusting God. But if we continue to lean on our own understanding, we are never getting off the ground. And perhaps some of you are like me, where you find way too much security, way too much safety in your own understanding. You want to keep your foot on the ground. But as long as we do that, we remain down here. And we will not get to where God desires and what he wants for us and what our own souls desire for. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with everything within you. Not simply an academic exercise, not just a knowledge because we know a pastor said we're supposed to and we know that the Bible said we're supposed to. But that actually within the depths of our core that we trust, we find security and safety boldness in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's going to be awkward watching me climb this. I'm going to be honest because I'm still. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What is that saying? It means in everything, recognize Christ. Acknowledge him. Know that he is present and there. What are the areas in your life that God is not allowed? What are the areas and categories you've made where this is a God area, but this is not? One of the things that keeps us from being able to trust God is that we truthfully don't feel safe and secure in sharing with God. We keep comfortable to a bit, but God is part of our life. He is not our life. We want to keep a foot on the ground where we're still in control. But we truthfully don't actually really trust him yet. There are two main things that I, I can think of that keep us from trusting God and keeping us, they keep us on the ground. One is this, pride. Pride. Belief that it's all about me, that I am in control, that I can do it on my own. Pride struggles for control and doesn't want to relinquish. Pride is the first sin that we see in the book of Genesis that keeps God out and the belief that I know better than God will keep me from trusting, will keep me from moving forward and putting my weight forward and trusting him. The second thing I, I believe that can keep us from trusting God is fear. Fear that often comes from past hurts. For some of you, you have experienced rejection. You have experienced times in the past in, in intimate relationships that you have had and have learned that people can't be trusted because your trust has been broken. Whether that was when you were two years old or 90 years old. That you've had experiences with individuals in your past that have left you feeling guarded. 
I'm not going to lie to you this morning. I struggle with trust. I have trust issues. And I think there's a lot of others this morning that you do too. I had an issue when I was a child where I'd, I got hurt by relationships. I had people who said things and did things that made it that I felt wounded deeply inside. And what I learned is I learned that people can only be trusted so far and you need to guard yourself. There can be some wisdom with that, but there's also dysfunction that comes from that. For those of you who are like me and you've witnessed dysfunction, without God, the reality is, is we all become dysfunctional people. Because even if our goal is to do the opposite of what we've seen, we try to course correct through dysfunction. And if you truly never learn to trust, it means you are a person who is always in control, which means you will be a person who is exhausted all the time, and you will also be a person who is limited in your life. The promises that God's word talks about of life to the full are not going to be things that you're able to embrace. Do you trust him? Do you feel safe and secure and bold in God? The website goodtherapy.org defines trust as this. It says, trust is that feeling you can rely on other people to be honest, fair, respectful. But issues arrive when the trust you have placed in others gets destroyed. You may have taken the risk of trusting another person, but it has gone badly, and you feel hurt, betrayed, and scared to trust again. Again, when you live through dysfunction in a relationship, you become dysfunctional in how you relate. not from a smart man. Those are just my words. Pretending it didn't happen doesn't allow you to to move forward. Just sucking it up doesn't get rid of your dysfunction. Building new life outside of that person or situation doesn't heal you. Only God can do that. Only God can reach into our depths and touch that pain. Only God can resonate with the hurt that you've experienced. And only God can release you from the cycle of shame and distrust and allow us to rebuild in health and wholeness. That's why Jesus said in in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Leaning on our own can lead us to actually not trust God at all. Or just trying to go part way where we never actually get anything and just blame God. Have you been hurt and left unhealed? And perhaps have those scars produced distrust in you? In 2020, God is calling you to take a step forward, to stop leaning on yourselves and trying to keep God while also trying to keep control. Because you will never get where you and God want you to be that way. You won't make it up the ladder. So the final question this morning is, how can I trust God? Again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Final part of this passage. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. In all, in the whole, in everything. In all your ways, your habits, your way of life, your path, your journey, your direction. Acknowledge God. Learn to know is what this means, or perceive, or know by experience. Do you know God? And trust means to have confidence in, to be bold, to be secure, and to feel safe. Who is God to you? Have you come to know him in all areas of your life? There is a big difference between true Christianity and religion. And it's all about relationship. How much time have you spent in knowing God? Psalms 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. Experience 
God. It's a book by Bob Boudouin called, uh, and he talks about the, the two chair exercise, where every day he wakes up and he has an empty chair that he sits across from. That empty chair is for God where he has an honest conversation with God. Then he, after he shares his questions, his concerns, and the things on his heart, then he takes time to listen for what the Spirit of God may say. And he does this every day. Does God know your situation? Is it too hard for him to handle? Does he have a good plan for you? These are the three questions he says to ask yourself. We need to allow God into every area of your life. No restriction zones. How does God feel about your job? The way you treat your spouse. How does God feel about your web history? How does God feel about how you invest your time? See, we are to acknowledge or know or experience God in all our ways. And then it says that he will make straight, agreeable or right, our path, our way. Now I want to be clear, this verse is not saying trust God and you won't face problems. Jesus himself said in this world you will have trouble, but as a follower of Jesus, you are, and you are not immune to struggle and challenge, but if we trust God, it helps with the heaviness. It helps take that away of having to figure out everything out on our own. When we trust, we no longer take all of the weight on ourselves. You're not trying to scale the wall. You're not trying to jump and leap and hang the Christmas lights on your own. That's never going to happen. When we trust, we no longer take all that weight on ourselves. But we trust, we lean in, we find security in. We more than hope for a good solution. We have a confidence in the one who ultimately is in control. So as we quickly close our our morning together, I have a few questions for you. What are the areas of life that God may be speaking to you about, about trusting him this year? Areas, whether it be because of pride, fear, and the word shame, which is related to both of those things. That has made it so that God has a restrictive zone in your heart. Youth this morning... Can you trust God with the decision of direction for your life after high school instead of just worrying about it? Young singles this morning, can you trust God to help bring that person he wants for you to spend your life with? Adults here this morning, can you trust God with your employment and the need to supply for your family? Parents, can you trust God with your kids to help guide their lives in making wise decisions? Can you trust him when they struggle or when they grow up independent and start to live life away from the protection of mom and dad? Can we trust God with his timing and his will for our health, our finances, our decisions, and our relationships? Can we begin to trust God by opening up to him, by being honest with him? Perhaps you would benefit from doing that two-chair exercise having a chair across from you and just beginning to have real, honest dialogue to God as if he's in the room right across from you. The reason why I say to do that is because he is. Because he's here with you now. We've talked about this over Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. But it's about us becoming aware of that, not God suddenly appearing. It's us becoming aware of his presence with us. Perhaps God's challenging you to trust about opening up with someone else, someone in your small group, or a member from this church, a spouse or a parent about something in your life that you've kept hidden. God's saying, I want you to trust me with that now. I want you to trust me that when people find out about where you've fallen, I won't abandon you. I won't leave you or forsake you. I won't simply yell shame on you and leave you trapped but I'll bring you to where you want to go and I'll bring you out 
of the pit where you find yourself now. Maybe it's trust is about being real and open about your struggles and failures. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask, there's little cards that are put out on the chairs. I'm going to ask if you want to grab one of those, and we're going to do a little exercise. And there's some extras lying around, so if you don't have one, maybe look at a chair, another one in the rows, or a chair in front of you, and find a card. And there should be pens in front of you as well. But I'm going to ask, maybe if in the sound in the back, if we could just have some music lightly going for about a minute or two here. But there's the question that's on the top there, and you're going to be challenged with questions every week. These are not New Year's resolutions. I, I'm asking that this would be a real prayerful exercise, but I, I trust that even in the brief time we've had together today, that I believe that God's Spirit can be speaking to your heart. What is it that God is placing and putting a heaviness and challenging you with right now? What's an area in your life where you need to move forward in trusting God? What's an area that you've allowed worry to control you rather than having security and boldness in God? We're going to take a minute, and I want you to write it down. We're going to hold on to these to be able to keep them as things to remind us this year of something that we're working on to do. So if we can just have some music in the back, we're going to take just a minute here. If you've wrote yours down, then I want you just to pray about it. God, help me to do this. We're going to take a minute just to think about what is that? What's it going to look like for me to trust God in 2020? Tom, you can just keep the music going, but just bring it down a little bit. I, I just, as we close, I, I just feel on my heart there's still some of you that are really trapped in this zone right here. You're trapped in this, I want to go, and I want to trust, and I want God, but I still want my feet on the ground. I still want to feel in control, and I want to challenge you and encourage you today. I was reading last night, I was reading a book called Soul Care, and he was talking about how he had a friend who was a child psychologist, and he noticed with his own kids that every time he disciplined them, they wouldn't look him in the eye. And he, he said, is that normal? She said, yes. Because children, when they are disciplined, often assume that their parents are angry with them and don't love them. And so he did an exercise where every time he disciplined his kids, he would ask them, does dad still love you? Some of you have experienced hardships in your life and you've experienced it just like a child experiences discipline, where you feel shame. Shame pulls us away from God and makes us feel like we are unworthy, unloving, and he would never want us. And I want to speak against that lie. Some of you, that's kept you away from making that decision, that simple decision to say yes to Jesus. Is because if God actually knew what was in my life, if God actually knew what I did, if he knew all the stuff that I've done and that I think every day, he wouldn't want me. Absolutely not. His response is, I still love you. Some of you have made a decision for Jesus and you still do that because you've made mistakes since and you don't think that you're good enough for God and so church for you is essentially penance. It's trying to somehow return God, return the favor, somehow pay him back. I give to the church or I do good works or I say nice things because that will somehow get me back in God's good books, but that's not it at all. He's already said, I know it and I know the stuff you're going to do. And the cross has already taken care of it. That's what the cross has done. It wasn't just for the stuff you did before you heard about me. It's the stuff you also did afterwards. It was paid for at the cross. 
trust me. Lean into me. Have boldness. Come to me and find security in me because I love you. I want to pray for you this morning, church. You'll just close your eyes with me. And I want to give that opportunity again today. If there is someone here and you have yet to make that decision, that bold step of leaning into God and saying, God, I want you. I want to know what it is to have you in my life in every way, every day. I don't want to live on my own anymore, and it's too much. I need you. I want to pray for you. So I'm going to give 10 seconds here. And if you're here this morning and you have yet to make that decision, I know Pastor Marlowe gave this invitation today already, but we just really don't want anybody to leave without that opportunity. If that's you, I'm going to ask for you to lift your hand and I'm going to pray for you specifically this morning. But I'm just going to give 10 seconds and then we're going to move forward. So if that's you, if you want to lift your hand, then we'll pray. Yes. Anyone else? Just pray this with me. If that's you and that's your heart attitude. Again, it's not about the words, but it's about the expression of our heart to, to Jesus inviting him in. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you that despite all the stuff I've done, still say you love me. So forgive me for our pride, our fear, our selfishness has been my God. And I want you to be my God now. Come live in me. Heal me. Free me. Empower me to live for you. Thank you. Jesus. Lord, I pray for each one this morning. I ask that we would no longer live according to fear, to shame, to pride, that that would no longer be our God. We pray this year in 2020, teach us what it is to trust. Help us to know your character so that we can trust. And for those of us who have yet to discover that, Holy Spirit, I pray that we would find if we take the steps of boldness, the steps of God, of just giving opportunity for you to speak into our lives, of having quiet time, of just talking to you and waiting and listening, that we would experience the Holy Spirit. I just pray that for each one who is desiring and sincere, I pray that. And this year you would teach us what it is to step out boldly, that we would see miracles, just as the, as the missions team talked about. I pray that we would see miracles in our lives here, where we're called to be, in Beaumont, at our schools, at our job places, at our homes, with our families, with our friends, that we would see miracles this year. So the things that we have written down, we want to offer those to you and say, we trust you. Teach us more of how to release and trust you more. May this year be an incredible year of you proving yourself again, you being glorified and worshiped, we pray. In Jesus' name. And if you agree for yourself, say amen.